Hello, I'm Andy Briggs and welcome to the Amazing Astronomical Alphabet, a weekly programme in which my Astro Radio co-presenter Daz and I will be talking about anything astronomy related which begins with the week's letter of the alphabet. We'll each choose some things to talk about which are in some way related to the universe, but neither of us will know what the other has chosen. We will then reveal facts about them which are weird, strange, bizarre or simply interesting. Well, hello, dear listeners, and welcome back to the Amazing Astronomical Alphabet with uh, with me, Andy, and uh, Daz. How are you, Daz? I'm fine, thank you very much. Um, just Glad been um, muddling through things. It's uh, dark here and because we've got lots of cloud and lots of... We've, we haven't seen any um, meteors, so we haven't seen it because of two reasons because one for the cloud and also it's been a full moon so uh yeah we've seen no meteors and we'll had a chance to actually see any, and of so, course uh, an eclipse moon because last night was the longest uh, lunar eclipse in 600 years and it yeah. will be the longest for another 180 years yeah and guess uh, what i guess how much we saw uh, nothing nothing <laughs> well we <laughs> we actually had a beautifully clear sky we had a completely clear day with not a cloud in the sky and a completely clear night the trouble is for me that uh, here it started at 1.30 in the morning mm-hmm. and uh, it, I was just too tired to stay up. I really was. So my, yeah. my daughter said, why don't you stay and watch the eclipse, Daddy? I said, why don't you go to sleep? So, uh, <laughs> you know. Um, but as you, I, was, I think for us it was something like four or five, six o'clock in the morning. Well, of course, by that time, we only had sort of like probably about an hour. But yeah, we could have seen it um, before yeah. the sun came up and um, ruined well, we, we, we had a bit longer, but uh, but it was the middle of the night. And to be honest, I had to get up at 730 for my daughter. So I thought, no, I don't know, because I can't I can't risk not doing that, obviously, because she has to go to school. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I thought now I, I've seen loads of lunar eclipses and they, they never vary very much, to be quite honest. Yeah, it just goes a bit orange and all yeah. that. They can be spectacular, but uh, yeah. Although yeah, I did hear from some people from where they were that the moon just didn't get red last night, it completely disappeared. It went oh, did it? dark, yeah. Oh yeah. so um I could forget where that was from. It could have been it could have been Kareem actually. Could have oh, okay, been Kareem. Then. Uh, I had a report. I was just going to say, did they get any images? But if there's nothing to photograph, yeah, he, he <laughs> because it's completely disappeared. He did post a couple when it was, um, you know, not long after the beginning of the eclipse. But um, yeah, okay. but anyway, so we'll have to wait 180 years to get a lunar eclipse that lasts for that long again. Yeah, I'll, I'll put uh, it in my diary. I'll put that in my diary as well. Uh, sad. And talking of sad, uh, dear listeners, uh, we have some sad news because today will be the last episode of. The amazing astronomical alphabet and the reason behind this is that we've got to the letter u and therefore logically we have u v w x y and z to go and we don't really have enough material to fill an entire program with uh, any of those letters really with the possible exception of w and seem to be more more interesting things beginning with w than anything so we've come to an editorial decision myself and daz that we're going to lump all of those remaining letters into this program. So this will be the amazing astronomical alphabet for interesting things about the universe, beginning with uh, U, V, W, X, Y, or Z. Obviously not all of them at the same time. Uh, very sad about that, but it was the only thing we could do really, given the, the, uh, the scarcity of material that we have. But fear not, because Daz and I will be back very soon with some more programs that we're working on together. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed our trip through the amazing astronomical alphabet. And uh, thank you very much for tuning in, if that indeed is what you have done. So there we are. So this is the last yeah. edition. Very sad. We've come to the end. We've had a lot of fun, haven't we, Daz? Yes. I mean, in the background, while you're talking about it, I've got r- r- playing in the back of my head, Vera Lynn as will meet again. <laughs> <laughs> Or as the or as the Inuits say, whale meat again. And, yeah, whale um, meat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, well, yes, it is. It is sad. It's the end of an era. Mm-hmm. I can't believe that we've got through the alphabet this quickly because uh, this yeah. means it's what twenty weeks now. We've been doing yeah. this, so twenty editions are up there on Mixcloud if you want to go and check them out. So, without further ado, as I said, thanks for listening, and uh, Daz and I will will come up with some more interesting stuff for you very soon we've we've got a few really good ideas so let us move on without further ado 
to today's program, and uh, I believe it's my turn to go first. Daz, is it? It not? certainly is. Right. So here's a, here's a nice one to get us started. U is for ultraviolet light. Now, ultraviolet light is generated by very hot objects. On the electromagnetic spectrum, it falls uh, between uh, uh, visible light and X-rays. So uh, if you want the technical, it's going from 400 nanometers at the low end uh, wavelength to uh, only 10 nanometers at the top end. So it straddle, straddles the gap between what you can see with your eyes and X-rays. Everything between what you can see with your eyes and X-rays is ultraviolet. Now, we know that the sun is a major source of ultraviolet light. And in fact, 10% um, of all of the sun's radiation is in the form of ultraviolet light because stars are big generators of, of ultraviolet light because they're so hot. If you want the others, 40% visible light and therefore logically 40% um, infrared. So um, that, doesn't, that doesn't add up to 100, does it? Never mind. But yeah, I was never very good at maths. Uh, that's true. I'm missing, I'm missing 10% somewhere. Anyway, um, so ultraviolet light uh, is really subdivided into three types that you're probably familiar with if you're a sun worshipper from buying suntan creams. UVA, UVB and UVC. Now, UVA is the longest wavelength ultraviolet light, and you will commonly find it in use um, in, um, you know, those ultraviolet lights that they have in discos and clubs and things that make, make your clothes fluoresce. That's UVA. And uh, it's, not, um, it's not harmful as other forms of UVA. Um, the majority of all ultraviolet light, incidentally, is absorbed by the Earth's ozone layer, which is just as well. Otherwise, would be irradiated because uh, it can be harmful. So um, UVA is not absorbed very well by the ozone layer, and it's known as soft UV. So uh, some of it does get through the Earth's atmosphere, but it's not harmful. On the other hand, UVB are the rays from the sun that, can, that cause sunburn and obviously exposed, uh, prolonged exposure to it can cause cellular damage, DNA damage, cancer, this sort of thing. But fortunately, about 95% of UVB rays are blocked by the Earth's ozone layer, which is why it's kind of important to look after the ozone layer. But on the other hand, we have evolved to need UVB to produce vitamin D, which is essential for life. And we have therefore a direct relationship with, with, with the sun because the, it's the only source of UVB radiation that we need to manufacture vitamin D, unless of course you take supplements and, and whatever. <laughs> but uh, so our evolution has evolved to be in sunlight basically to, 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 uh, to absorb uh, ultraviolet B. The most harmful, even more harmful than UVB, is UVC, ultraviolet C rays. And these are the most harmful, and even a short exposure to those can do you some real harm. But the good news is that they're almost completely absorbed by the ozone layer. They don't get through to the Earth's surface. So we're in no danger from UVC. Now, when it comes to astronomy, <clears throat> astronomers subdivide uh, UV, in, not into A, B, and C, but into three types known as the near ultraviolet, which is the longest wavelength, therefore the, the closest on the spectrum to visible light, and that's known as um, NUV, near ultraviolet, the middle ultraviolet, or MUV, and the far ultraviolet, believe it or not, FUV, but there's one even beyond that, known as extreme ultraviolet. Uh, which, not surprisingly, is, a, is uh, abbreviated to e e EUV. Uh, or should that be acronymized, not abbreviated? Now, the problem is for astronomers that they would dearly love to observe objects that radiate ultraviolet radiation because they tend to be hot, energetic objects. But because you, the majority of UV light doesn't get through the atmosphere, they need to use space telescopes to observe uh, objects in the ultraviolet. And there have been a long history of space telescopes 
that have um, been put in orbit to observe objects in ultraviolet light. Now, most of them have not been dedicated ultraviolet telescopes. They've been so-called multi-wavelength telescopes that look at a range of uh, electromagnetic radiation across the spectrum. And as far as I can make out, there's only one space telescope, a dedicated telescope that only looks at UV, still in operation. And do you know where it is, Daz? <laughs> um, Hawaii? No, space telescope, unless, uh, oh, unless, uh, unless uh, Hawaii has had a massive <laughs> volcanic eruption and uh, been blown into orbit. Um, <laughs> pay attention, pay attention. Oh, yeah, pay attention. Um, wake, wake up at the background. A UV um, space yeah, telescope. There's a de it's a dedicated telescope, the only space telescope that just looks at UV. UV, UV, UV. I can't think of, and I, um, it's not Spritzer. <laughs> this, this, no. Um, this well, is going to surprise you. Now. It's on the moon because oh, it? it's on the Chinese Chang'e 3 lander that uh, oh, landed on the Mare Imbrium. Yes, it has a dedicated, I think it's a, a four and a half inch uh, dedicated UV telescope. And they've been doing <laughs> UV observations from, from the moon. The surprising thing is that the Chang'e lander landed on the moon eight years ago and that UV telescope is still going strong as is the rest of the lander. The rover that it deposited onto the surface only lasted for about a few weeks, I think. But uh, they've been doing observations. And if you look it up, there's a lovely ultraviolet image of the pinwheel galaxy taken from the moon, which mm -hmm. I think it's so wonderful to see astronomy done from the moon. It's wonderful to see images yeah. taken from the moon, in, in, admittedly in the ultraviolet. But they've also been doing some great work with variable stars uh, in the UV range. Uh, from the surface of the moon. So that's great. Oh, and I didn't know that. Was yeah. yeah. So uh, that, that's where the only dedicated UV telescope in space is, as far as I can make out. All the other telescopes have uh, launched, you know, done a few years and are defunct. Mm -hmm. More space junk. But um, yeah, so the only, only ongoing one is on the moon, which is great, I think. So there you are. Yeah. That's ultraviolet light for you. Yeah, because, so, of course, ultraviolet light, um, uh, a lot of people don't realise that UVA and UVB, there's two different types. Um, you've got to make sure you've got suntan lotion that uh, protects you against both of them, because, as you said, yes, UVB can give you serious burns. Yeah. Um, but also, just a warning to everybody who likes to go on their continental holidays, make sure it's in date. Um, oh, because God, these yes. things do degrade. Good point. Um, Good point. And um, of course, so if you've had it for in your bag for a couple of years, ditch it and then uh, buy some new stuff. Yeah, and I, I don't, I don't know what the the thinking is that virtually now, when I go on holiday, um, everybody smells a coconut. So I don't know why they've all scented them coconut flavor. I don't know why, um, but uh, yeah, everybody smells of coconut. And of course, um, it, because of we, uh, uh, the UV does, some of the UV does get down to the ground level. Um, it varies where you are on the earth. Yeah, um, yeah, indeed. And this is why we get different skin tones because um, is it melanin? Um, yes, it's in melanin, the skin? Yeah, yeah. yeah the, um, the skin that varies to protect mm. ourselves. Um, where it's very high, then uh, you'll have a darker skin. And this is why you do tan when you go on holiday. It's a protection against uh, UV rays. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, and a lot so... of people say, well, you know, um, in Scandinavia, they should have black skin to absorb more, yeah. um, more UV, but they don't. They're, they're pale skinned, as we know. Yeah. Um, so, so there we are. Yeah, because also when you mention UVA is the disco lights, if anyone had a false tooth, it would be black. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> so that's everybody right. knew you had a false tooth at the front of your mouth. Yeah. Um, and uh, as we said, we need it for vitamin D. U is for Yuri. That's R uh, U R E Y, as in Harold Yuri. Uh, Does he ring a bell? Not at all. Please continue. No, he's the gentleman who discovered deuterium. Is he really? um, for, for which he won a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Wow. Um, he also was very successful in other fields. Um, I'll just give you a couple of his uh, uh, 
things he actually got into. Um, he discovered how our planet's previous climates can be found from the ratio of oxygens, oxygens, mm. that's yes. the plural, um, isotopes in carbonate rocks. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, um, seashells, uh, animals that produce seashells make them out of uh, carbon, uh, carbonates, and when they uh, break down, they form as rocks and all that, but you can actually detect <clears throat> the climates of the time of when these things were actually formed. So he's right. able to dis distinguish the different eras when different isotopes of um, oxygen were at different levels. I so see. Very intelligent. Yeah. Hey, um, he was, yeah. He was in charge of uh, 700 scientists. Not so good. This the Manhattan Project. Oh really? Uh, which, ah, now um, it rings which, a bell. Yes. Which now, now which of course um, was the USA's <laughs> uh, hydrogen bomb. Um, he coined the term cosmochemistry and founded monetary uh, monetary modern planetary science. Um, so he's basically considered the the, um, the founder of uh, planetary science. Hmm. Um, he also just um, deduced the Earth's early atmosphere consisted mainly of hydrogen, ammonia, and methane, and water, and that, that um, and water, and that these react with one another when lightning passes through them. Um, now, if you remember when we were talking about, I can't remember what, what letter we were on, but we did discuss um, this famous. Uh, uh, experiment where they had all these things mixed together in a, a, a fat flask. Ah, uh, yes. Um, yes. And then they passed it. And it was the Miller Yuri experiment. And oh, that was in 1951. Yes, of course, was. Yes, yeah, of course I remember that. And yes. what they found is once they passed electric through all this primordial gases and soups and all that, they were able to make amino acids, which of course are the building blocks for life. I think we, we discussed it under panspermia. Um, yes, um, but, but have you heard the latest about that experiment? This, no, is, yeah. this is really amazing, that they've re-examined the experiment. Yeah. In particular, they've re-examined the glass flasks that it was done in. And remember at the time, um, they produced, actually, they managed to actually produce 21 different amino acids from this mm -hmm. experiment to replicate the atmosphere of the early Earth as you said, with the addition of uh, electricity to simulate lightning strikes. And what they found was that the glass of these flasks was made from silicates that were dissolving in the chemical mixture and adding silicate particles to the mix. Um, okay. So what this means is that inadvertently they introduced something else that would have been on the surface of the early Earth in the rocks, because obviously, you know, the majority of Earth's rocks contain big quantities of silicates. And what they're saying is this is why they got such a positive reaction, because they'd un if they hadn't used that type of glass, they might have got no results or very few results. But the fact that after just a couple of weeks, they got 21 amino acids out of this primordial mix of gases and lightning. Um, it was the silicates in the rock that, that, that caused that, that caused the, the, the amino acids to, to form in a, in a way, of course, we still don't fully understand. But what it means is for the future is that when we look at planets and the possibility of life on other planets, if there are silicates in the rocks, then there's a very good chance that the same chemical reactions could take place, i.e. the production of amino acids, which, as we know, on this planet led to life. So that's that's quite incredible. Um, I, oh, I, I, yes. I, was, I was watching watching something about that recently. Um, so, oh, I didn't. I, I missed that. So yeah, I'll see if I can uh, find, find the, the video. Because I'll, isn't I'll there also... Yeah, because because we're, we're carbon based, mm. but isn't silica the next one that can be considered to possibly form? No, that, we're talking that, about... that's an old wives' tale. Uh, oh, is it? Uh, I'm just, yeah. just, uh, okay, no, no, I'm it's, an old it's, wife. that yeah. idea has been around for years, yeah. and um, you silica know, based life, yeah, silica based. No, because silicon for for life as we know it, and I stress as we know it to exist, mm. then as we know it. only. In the, in the periodic table, only carbon can can take the number of forms that you need for life. 
and okay. carbon can occur yeah. in so many different forms. You think of carbon, you think of graphite, soot, coal, and so on. And there's a huge list of different types of carbon, all of which are needed to some extent or another to form life. Silicon cannot take many forms. Okay. So um, so it's quite uh, useless. I know there was a big thing about it many years ago. Back in the 70s, it. everybody was talking about yeah. silicon-based life. And, of course, when computers came in, which, you know, used silicon chips, it became quite an idea. Or perhaps we could, you know, perhaps there could be life out there in the universe with silicon as its base instead of carbon. No, mm. it's a non-starter, mm. I'm afraid. Oh, okay, then. But having okay, said then. that, having said that, um, of course, we have hydrocarbons. On Titan, Saturn's moon Titan, for example, you've got uh, liquid ethane, liquid methane. And somebody came up with a model of an organism that could live in liquid methane or yeah. liquid ethane. And um, a computer simulation of an organism that could possibly survive. Very interesting stuff. So yeah. there we are. So, yeah. um, so, the, uh, uh, so uh, Mr. Yuri, he had quite yeah. a varied career then. He certainly did. I mean, he worked, um, basically, I'll just give you, he came from very um, poor beginnings, literally right. was poor beginnings. Um, he was born in 19, uh, 1893. His father was a small scale farmer, a school teacher, and he's also a lay preacher in a, in the church of the brethren, a somewhat austere pacifist um christian dominant denomination um so mm. yeah, even a yeah, denomination um so he probably had an austere upbringing mm. um, his mother also was a housewife and farmer she was a school teacher um and she looked after the children his, his father died quite early mm. which meant they had to move in uh, uh with uh, his uh, um grandmother Mm. um and uh he had very limited education to begin with uh his grandmother at age 11 his grandmother died um so of course again they had to move and they moved further into indiana mm. uh roaring and uh where they grew uh onions to make oh, a really? living oh yeah. right um and of course, his school like i said his schooling was very <clears throat> very uh, little um but he, he managed to prosper and bring and pull himself up and he uh, gained a teaching degree. So he was able to teach. Mm. Um, then he went on to university and uh, studied other things. Uh, but one of them was not actual um, chemistry at the time. Um, he also moved to, um, where was it he moved to? Was it Denmark? Yeah, Denmark. And he spent a year just studying under Neil, Niels Bohr's. Oh, Neil um, Bohr, yeah. Neil yeah. Bohr's, again, another Nobel Prize winner. Mm. Um, and uh, he went on and it made him realise that basically he wanted to, discover, to, to, to do chemistry. Mm. And then he moved back to America and gained a chemistry degree. Um, as I said, he described um, uh, deuterium, which is uh, heavy hydrogen. Yes. Um, and this was first professor. Uh, proposed by um a jj thompson in 1913 Go saying on. that um, have, yeah, have different masses which we call t isotopes and of course this wasn't actually uh, wasn't discovered really until uh, 1932 when james chadwick discovered the neutron so of course yuri went into it saying that hydrogen could have a, a heavier uh, state and that's how he then, of course, they discovered neutrons. And if a neutron joins with the nucleus of a hydrogen atom, that makes it heavier. So that gives us a heavy deuterium. Right. And for that, that's what he actually won the Nobel Prize for. As I said, he was involved with the Manhattan Project mm. uh, as one of the lead um, uh, ke chemists. Um, and in the First World War, he was also, um, because of his chemistry, he was uh, involved in making ex um, explosives and things like that. Um, again, yeah, I, like think, I think I heard that. He, I think I read that his wife was a chemist as well. It must have been because there was always such a chemist. Yeah, um, the, I, was, I was just. I'll come to that in a little bit. Uh, okay. Uh, later, um, but yeah, she. Like I said, he um, he uh, uh, paleo paleoclimate studies where he discovered um, about temperatures and the uh, the climates. Um, and then he went on to um, develop theories about planet formations and things like that. And as I said, he became known as become known as the, the father of modern planetary science. 
<clears throat> and of course, he considered again going back to the Miller Urey experiment in 1951. Mm. Uh, how earth how life began on earth so again all back to the chemistry stuff and all that uh he married frida dorm who was a bacteriologist oh yeah bacteriologist that's right yeah and they had four children um he carried on working right up to almost to his death uh, and when he was aged 87 he died in 1981 so had a good old life wow um and uh so like I said, he was a very had his finger in lots and lots of pies. Lots and lots of pies. And we've yeah. got to thank him, thank him for uh, all his work and stuff like that. So Absolutely. yeah, and he carried on working right up to the end in, in uh, um, 1981. And he'd fought so in the first is, world. He'd been in the first world war. Wow. Yeah, and and the second. And the second, yeah, 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 because he, uh, well, he Gosh. was probably one of the instigators in bringing it to a, a conclusion. Mm, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So that is uh, Harold Jewelry. Well worth a look if you anyone. Thank you very much, though. That's really interesting. Yeah, but when minute you said the Miller U experiments, I thought, ah, yes, it's him. Yes, I remember. Uh, V is for Vega. Now, Vega is a brilliant blue white star that, if you go out on a summer night in the northern hemisphere, is right above your head. If you look straight up, you will see the very brilliant blue white star of Vega. It's uh, it's the brightest star in the constellation of Lyra, uh, the Lyre. Uh, not too far from the famous Crab Nebula, which is in the same constellation. Uh, sorry, not the Crab Nebula, the Ring Nebula. That's what I meant to say. Crab Nebula is in Taurus, of course. Uh, the Ring Nebula, e a lovely sight. Even through a small telescope, you can clearly see the ring of the Ring Nebula. It's a planetary nebula, and the ring is a shell of material that's cast off by a, a star reaching the end of its life. And um, the thing about Vega is that... It was the, I think it was the first star that was observed to have what they call an infrared excess. And this was observed by IRAS, the orbiting infrared satellite in 1983. I think it was 83, it was around then. And the infrared access showed itself as a, a disk of material, a flattened disk, like looking at a galaxy edge on more or less uh, around Vega. And this is a uh, planetary system in the process of formation that was discovered in the infrared, uh, in other words, through its heat, by the orbiting uh, IRAS satellite. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that was the first star that was uh, shown to have this infrared excess. So there we are. And that's it in a nutshell. There's not much more you can say about Vega. Obviously, it's a very young star because it's brilliantly blue-white. It's a lovely sight in even a small telescope and uh, well worth having a look. Of course, to look at it through a telescope, you have to point your telescope vertically during the summer, which is <laughs> not easy. Yeah. Um, but, um, but anyway, in the next summer, do go and have a look at v Vega and uh, you'll find on the net directions to the Ring Nebula from Vega. And that's well worth a, a, a look even in even small telescopes, M57, the Ring Nebula. So there you are, Daz. That's it in a nutshell. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, Planetary Nebula. Yeah, I'm just trying to think, was it Vega or... Well, it doesn't matter. Well, Vega. Yeah, it's a very pretty star. I know that. It's a very, very pretty very, star, very indeed. Pretty it's, star. Like, it's, like a, it's like a diamond ring. It's just beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, okay, and then thanks, Andy. Um, my V is... V is for Vulcan. Oh. Um, which was um, now <laughs> this is a three and one, three, two, one. Go on. um, basically, you got uh, Vulcan, which was a hypothetical planet that some 19th century astronomers thought existed in an orbit between Mercury and the Sun. Mm. Its existence was first proposed by the French mathematician Urbain Le Verrier. Oh, the very, um, yeah. whose, whose calculations found peculiarities in uh, Mercury's orbit, which he thought were the result of gravitational influences of another unknown nearby planet or a series of asteroids. Aster asteroids? Asteroids. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, a number of searches were made for Vulcan, but despite occasional claimed observations, no such planet was ever confirmed. The existence of the planet was later disproved by Einstein's 1950 theory of general rel relativity, uh, which showed that the, proper, the peculiarities in uh, Mercury's orbit were the result of the curvature of space-time caused by the mass of the Sun. 
Absolutely. Um, I've read lo loads of theories about what this Vulcan was. Um, there was even some people who said that it had broken up and they could see uh, lines of debris mm. um, and things like that. I think it was uh, what they wanted to Wishful see. Thinking, yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah. So, yes, it was, it was this imagined planet that was close to the sun. Um, uh, and it was Leverio who basically announced it on January 1860. And then he did, he proposed the name Vulcan after the god Vulcan from the Roman mythology. Mm. Um, and that's where it all started from. God but of fire, it's, wasn't it has, he Vulcan, I think. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Fire, fire, fire and brimstone. But then, of course, then along come Mr. Einstein and said, well, the peculiar uh, actions of, because um, they made lots of surveys, they even had special. Um, expeditions to try and uh, with eclipses to try and find it, but it mm. never happened. They never found it, and it was all uh, down so to relativity. Extent, yeah, all down to relativity and Mister Einstein. Absolutely right. The second Vulcan, and Andy's going to love this. No, is, don't do it. Don't go there. Yeah. Don't go there. Please don't go there. <laughs> it's Star Trek. Ah! <laughs> I've been there. I've gone there. Down the door and... slamming and footsteps receding. <laughs> <in the distance. laughs> and of course, it was the home of Mister Spock. But according to the uh, storyline, th that uh, Vulcan uh, actually orbited uh, the, the planet orbits 40 Eradani A, uh, which is actually a, a true star. Mm. But in the uh, storyline, it all, it, which is, and of course, uh, 40 Eradani A, in the storyline, it's about 16 light years away. And of course, it is actually from um, Earth or uh, you know, from us, is 16.39 light years away from our solar system. Yeah. But we of course, on the Starship Enterprise, you can do it in 10 minutes. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. We will we'll be yeah, doing easy, it next easy. year. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, it's um, it, the, the planet Vulcan in the storyline was located in a triple star system of 40 Eradni. Right. And then, of course, in 2018, da, 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 mm -hmm. Um, the uh, astronomers actually found a planet which was actually orbiting 40 Arad Arad uh, Eridini yes, right. uh, right. A. And, of course, everybody got all excited because mm. they now believe um, that they found Vulcan. Yeah. And um, it's been uh, it's actually designated uh, HD 26965, very romantic name. And it's... Uh, uh, just inside the habitable zone where water could exist in liquid form and where life as we know it could be possible. So it's a rocky planet then. Yeah. Mm. And uh, as you said, everybody uh, got all excited and said, we've actually found Vulcan. Um, but of course, Vulcan really didn't exist. Um, it was just uh, fictional or um, yeah, a planet be. that we thought was there and it turns out it wasn't. But they have actually now, now put, put, put forward that it actually be called Vulcan. Well, in, that's a good idea. I think that's a good Zeno. idea. I mean, you so, know, people who love Star Trek, and uh, that would be nice for them, and I'm, I'd be happy for them. And it's yeah. it's better than HD, whatever the number was, anyway. So, yeah. uh, so <laughs> oh, it rolls off the turn two yeah. six nine six five. Ah, uh, yeah, three six nine six five. Now, yeah, it's very Vulcan, romantic. That's fine. I mean, call them all Vulcan. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> anything's better than you know anything's better than yeah. the, the catalog numbers, which are important, so, of course. But yeah. but um, you know, as as we get to know these planets, I'd like to think that we could give them nice names. Exactly. I mean, so it's basically gone from being a hypothetical pro, uh, pl uh, planet to, to uh, a fictional planet to actually a planet circling. A real planet. Yeah. A real planet. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. That's, That's amazing. Vulcan for you. Um, now, I mean, I, I joke about hating Star Trek. I, you know, I, I grew up with the original series of Star Trek when I was a kid. Yeah. And I loved it. And, uh, you know, as long as you remember that it, it is a, you know, it's a bubblegum soap opera in space. Um, then you know it's harmless enough. It's when people start to take it really seriously and attend conventions in the costumes and <clears throat> and sort of seem to lose the distinction between fact and reality, which was brilliantly lampooned in the film Galaxy Quest, of course. Mm. And um, and that sort of that sort of a, a strange American culture where fantasy in fact becomes somewhat blurred, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and uh, that was a brilliant send up. 
Incidentally, I read recently, you've seen Galaxy Quest, haven't you, Daz? Yeah, yeah. 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 I read recently they're going to make a series of it. And oh, uh, because they've got Sigourney Weavers in it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. They've they've they can't think of the bloke's name. Uh, no, I can't think of his name either. Yeah. But um, but sadly, uh, Alan Rickman has has left us. Yeah, so, passed um, away. Yeah, he, he, he so uh, and he, I th- I still think that film was one of his finest acting moments because he played that part so <laughs> brilliantly. And um, but I mean that was him, wasn't it? This sort of annoyed, you know, fed up character. Uh, that he played mm. so well. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so let's move on now to um, W. Mm-hmm. And um, I've got a very short one for W. Well, actually, let's put these two together because they are actually related. So the first W is W is for white hole. Now, mm-hmm. why a white hole is the opposite of a black hole. So instead of pulling matter in, it spits matter out. Some people seem to think that this means that they actually exist when they actually don't, or as far as we know, they don't. All that it is with a white hole, you take the equations of general relativity, which give you a black hole, which describe how a black hole forms, and you reverse them in time. You do them backwards. So if you do the equations of general relativity backwards for a black hole, you end up with a white hole, which is the opposite. But it's just a mathematical curiosity. It's there is absolutely no evidence that they could ever exist in nature or have ever existed in nature. So uh, some people say that the um, the singularity of the Big Bang was a white hole, that our universe was 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 vomited out of a white hole. And uh, firstly, we now don't think that there was a singularity at the Big Bang. The, the latest research seems to say, no, what, what we think is a, if you compare it to a singularity that exists at the center of a black hole, then it was very different. It wasn't the singularity in that sense. But even if you think of the word singularity, a lot of people seem to think that's a thing as well, but it's not. At the center of a black hole, all that happens is our equations of relativity, of physics, of everything, they just don't apply at the center of a black hole and we don't know what does. But there is no suggestion that a singularity is actually a thing. It's just a place where our current maths and physics fails to apply because of the incredibly extreme conditions. So what what, uh, relativity says and other black hole related math says is that at the center of a black hole, there is... A, an infinitely small mass of infinite density, which, you know, is ludicrous. That's how we know that something has gone wrong, because that is not conceivable in any way at all, that you could have something of infinite density. But we don't really know what there is there. And in a sense, we never will, because you can go into a black hole, but you can never tell anybody outside about what you found. So it's, we can only ever model this area mathematically. And whether we will ever have an explanation for what's at the centre of a black hole uh, is is debatable uh, because our current, well, probably our future maths uh, will, will, will not give us the answer to that. We can only surmise and there will never be any categorical empirical observations of it because of the reason I stated that you can't communicate with the outside world. Once you're in a black hole, you can't communicate through the event horizon. So we'll never know. And this brings us to the second W, because some people think they know what's at the center of black hole. It's W is for wormhole. And some people believe uh, actually this has quite a bit of support from some scientists saying that it's a tunnel through space time to another place in the universe where that is, you know, we, we couldn't say, but it, But they say, look, it's theoretically possible that what there actually is at the center of a black hole is a hole through the universe where you could travel from one side of the universe to another without having to change even your shirt. So um, this is one of the the things that's been poor. And it's got support from from quite a few scientists. The technical name for a, a, a wormhole is known as an Einstein Rosen bridge because of, after Mr. Einstein and Mr. Rosen, who uh, obviously were two famous scientists, Nathan Rosen, mathematician, 
It is a mathematical solution only, incidentally. It doesn't have any real uh, application in, in, in the real world. It's just, again, a mathematical curiosity. Now, lots of people have said, well, these, this might exist. On paper, mathematically, wormholes can exist. But you try and make one and you run into an immediate problem that the wormhole is so unstable that it closes almost as soon as it opens within seconds of it opening, which wouldn't be much good for, for travel, really. And, uh, you know, it's like British Rail telling you that your train's been diverted, you know, no, no use whatsoever. <laughs> so scientists say, well, you could hold the mouth of the wormhole open to stop it closing if you had some exotic matter that had negative mass. And this is where it starts to get really silly because on paper, again, mathematically, if you had something that had negative mass, yes, you could hold the throat, if you like, of the wormhole open long enough to venture inside it and to see where you came out. Uh, but the problem is we don't even know what the term negative mass actually means. You can play around with maths and you can say, OK, well, this has got mass. Let's say it's got a, a mass of plus 50 kilograms. Let's just reverse the sign on that and make it minus 50 kilograms. Now we can hold open the, the throat of the wormhole with, with something like that. But what on earth does negative mass mean? It, it, it's, a, it's a nonsense. It doesn't really exist in the real world. Uh, you can't have negative amount of mass. You can only have positive amounts of mass, of course. So I'm afraid that both white holes and wormholes are mathematically interesting, but they don't, as far as we know, have any um, application in the real world. So the question is, so, you know, apart from manufacturing your own wormhole, which I don't think even Airfix did as a kit once, then... Um, what about a black hole? Could a black hole generate a wormhole and, and keep it open or on its own? And um, to quote the late, great Sir Patrick Moore, we simply do not know. Uh, and that is the, the bottom line. We don't know what goes on in the middle of a black hole. And as I said, we probably never will. Sorry, sci-fi fans, but that's the way it is. That's the real universe out there. So there you are. So there are my two, uh, two uh, short Ws, Daz. So uh, yeah. what, what have you got there? Well, of course, with wormholes, of course, they are real because it's on Deep Space Nine. Yeah, well. Uh, yeah. And also in Einstein Rosen bridges are on the Avengers because that's how Thor moves around. So they do oh, exist. So there you go. See? More crap American sci-fi. Yeah, sci-fi. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, God. Yeah. Yeah. You've just burst a lot of bubbles. <laughs> yeah. But we got the expanse coming back on, on TV on December the 10th. So I'll make a note of that. Yeah. yeah. Make December the 10th is a new season of the expanse. If you haven't watched the expanse on, on TV, I think it's, think it's on uh, HBO or yeah. it, no Amazon, isn't it? It's Amazon. Yeah, it's on Amazon. Yeah. 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 Uh, started on HBO. Then Amazon bought it when HBO yeah. canceled it. The best sci-fi ever on television, the expanse. Really good, and yeah. the new no, I do enjoy it. Yeah, and the sixth it. and final season starts on December the 10th on Amazon. Okay. Then my W is water bears. Oh, lovely. Also known as tardigrades or moss piglets. Moss um, piglets? that one. Moss piglets, yeah. Yes. Um, they, uh, they are a phylum of eight-legged uh, segmented micro animals. Uh, and uh, they were first discovered by the German zoologist Johann August um, Ephraim uh, Goes mm. in 1773, who called them Kleiner Wasser Bear, uh, which means little water bear. In 1777, the Italian biologist Lazzaro uh, Spallanzani Spil mm. uh, called them tardigrades or slow steppers. Oh. Um, they have been found everywhere in Earth's biosphere, and we mean everywhere from mountaintops to the deep sea uh, and mud, mud volcanoes, and from tropical forests to the Antarctic. Tardigrades are uh, among the most resilient animals known, with individual species able to survive extreme conditions such as exposure to extreme temperatures, extreme pressures, both high and low, air deprivation, radiation, dehydration and starvation. 
um, that would quickly kill most other forms of life. Tardigrades have survived exposures to outer space. They're basically extremophiles, and they are yeah. the extreme stream uh, thing. The, these They're are about, the kings of extreme. They really are. Exactly. Aren't they? There are about uh, 1,300 known different species. Good grief. Yeah. Oh. The earliest. Yeah, they all, they all vary. Have you ever seen any pictures of them? They all vary in different ways. They've all evolved to do different things. Wow. Um, and they are. They're really amazing creatures. Uh, the earliest known true members of the group are known from Cretaceous, which is 145 to 66 million years ago, mm. uh, amber found in North America, but are essentially, but uh, are essentially modern forms and therefore uh, likely to have a significantly uh, earlier origin as they diverge <laughs> from their closest relatives in the Cambrian over 500 million years ago. Right. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're really ideal things. You can actually, you'll find them in the moss in your gutters and things like that. They're microscopic. Um, they're about um, 0 0.020 inches long uh, when fully grown. Uh, they're short and plump. Oh, just like me. With <laughs> hair, with, with four pairs of, <laughs> four hairy pairs of legs. Uh, with four pairs of legs, which um, extended in, in claws. Um, yeah, very much like you, in fact. Yeah. exactly yeah. yeah yeah um and or suction discs as i said they've all evolved to do different to live in different uh, things tardigrades are prevalent in mosses and lichens and feed on plant cells algae and small invertebrates when collected they may be viewed under low power microscope making them accessible to students and amateur scientists so they're absolutely fantastic things and as we said they are so extreme that they have actually been used in space research. I'm just drawing like, here we go. Poor tardigrades. Um, yes, the little tardigrades. Um, tardigrades are the first known animals to survive a, a, after exposure to outer space. Um, they were basically uh, a, sent up uh, on the Photon M3 mission, uh, carrying a biopan uh, astrobiology payload. Mm. For 10 days, groups of tardigrades, some of them previously dehydrated because they go into this state of um, what, sort of like hibernation. Some of them not, were exposed to the hard vacuum of outer space or vacuum, uh, at solar v, um, or vacuum and solar UV radiation. So we're back to your, your ultraviolet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, back on Earth, more than 68% of the subjects protected from uh, solar UV radiation were re reanimated within 30 minutes following rehydration. Wow. Um, although subsequent mortality was a little bit high. Uh, many of these produced viable embryos, so it didn't affect their reproduction um, in any way. Um, in contrast, hydrated samples exposed to the combined effect of the vacuum and the full solar UV radiation had significantly reduced survival with only three subjects of a um, Minosium uh, tardigraeum surviving. So they can survive in space for short periods of time um, when they've been uh, dehydrated. But also uh, in August 2019, scientists reported that a capsule containing tardigrades in a cryobotic state, which means mm. they were asleep, uh, may have survived for a while on the moon after the the April uh, after the April 2019 crash landing of Beersheet uh, probe, it, uh, a failed Israeli land, uh, lunar lander. Mm. Uh, but in May 2021, it was reported that they were unlikely to have survived the impact. Well, of course, we now know that they've actually did it, done experiments where they've loaded them into um, bullets and fired from a gun at a target and they have survived yeah they have survived so, yeah, absolutely. so basically when we get back to the moon we're going to find some really ticked off tardigrades mm. um for actually being left there for so long and they've probably and, mutated well with so, all that um, uv on the moon perhaps they mutated into you know six foot high really, really pissed off uh, really angry yeah you know, so don't I wouldn't call go... us little water bears anymore <laughs> yeah um, yeah piglet so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> who are you calling yeah, piglet? So, um there's also <laughs> been some talk about spray splicing tardigrade genes in to human genes so uh yeah so I'll, I'll stop that one there but they are absolutely fantastic lovely little creatures and uh 
they they will help us hopefully uh, along with other things like uh, zebra fish uh, we go into a state called torpor um, mm. which they when they're in torpor uh, they're protected a lot from um, uh, radiation exposure and things like that so maybe when we get start moving out into the atmosphere we will uh, atmosphere out into space we will be using these the genes of these people or perhaps uh, to I uh, kind of like to... that idea because um you know obviously we need hands so claws wouldn't be much good to us but if, if we had some uh, tidy suckers gauges, yeah, yeah cu- couple of extra legs with suckers that would help me when i'm climbing the wall after dealing with my daughter definitely so uh, <laughs> so uh, you know so uh, yeah. there we are i'd just Bless like to heart. do yeah. I'd like just to do a very, very quick one, and it is very quick. Go on, then. Do you know what the Widmanstatten patterns are? Is this anything to do with knitting? No, 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 no. no. no, no, no. It's okay. not far off, actually, when you think about it. Oh, okay. Um, Win, Winmanstatten patterns or Thompson structures uh, are when you get a, a metallic meteorite, Oh, that's the, the, the yeah, the 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 yeah. Patterns, yeah, uh, yeah. When you yeah. treat it with nitric yeah, acid or something like that, you get and these then lovely wipe lines. it all off. You mm. get these lovely lines, and they sort of like cross cre- across each other. Yeah, they're very and they do look actually. like a knitting pattern. Yeah, they do, they do. Yeah. So uh, you were quite close with that. Yeah, uh, but that absolutely. is that was just a very quick, and some of them can be really, really, really attractive. Right, right, really okay. nice. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. That was just a quick one. How we doing for time? 52 minutes. Oh, okay. So we haven't got much time left. No. Uh, so moving on then, very quick one for X. X ray, X is for X ray binary. And this is a star system where you have, a, 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 if you like, a normal star like the sun or, you know, any, any other star that's uh, behaving itself normally, but it has a companion and they are co orbiting and the other companion is a dense object such as a white dwarf or a neutron star or potentially even a black hole. And what happens is that the immense gravity of the collapsed object tears material off the surface of the normal star um, and uh, forcing it to adopt a sort of a teardrop shaped shape. And the material accelerates towards the collapsed object such as a white dwarf or neutron star as it accelerates the uh, the material in the in the plasma, which is essentially what is dragging off the star, bumps together and heats up to enormous temperatures and generates a lot of X rays. And this is why they're called X ray binaries because we know we detect them from this output of of X rays. And X ray binaries were in the news recently because you may remember that astronomers think they've discovered a planet in another galaxy, which is a, a tremendous achievement. And this is an X, they think it's an X-ray binary system because uh, they, the, the characteristics of the X-rays coming from this system indicates that it is an X-ray binary system and something is regularly shutting off the X-rays as seen from the Earth. And they think that's a planet passing between uh, the, the normal star and, and the Earth. And uh, if that is confirmed, and it has yet to be confirmed, then this will be a truly amazing achievement to detect uh, a planet orbiting a star in another galaxy. And just to remind our listeners, all galaxies are millions of light years away from the Earth. So this is quite an achievement. Uh, No, sorry, that's not strictly true. Apart from the small and large Magellanic clouds and the uh, other dwarf galaxies that orbit the Milky Way. But if we're talking about other spiral galaxies, and indeed other elliptical galaxies, they're all millions of light years away. And this particular galaxy, I can't remember which one, which one it was, but uh, it's a, it was a spiral galaxy, millions and millions of light years away. And we've managed to detect um, a planet orbiting one of its stars if this bears out, which is quite an achievement. So that's my X, Daz. That's a very short X-ray binary star. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that's uh, really... Uh... Really interesting. Um, mine's also a very short one, and it's X-ray gas. Ah. Um, and basically, what they what we're talking about is X-ray halos around um, uh, galaxies, um, and also you find it in the interstellar, interstellar spaces between uh, galaxies in galaxy clusters. Right. Um, it's also one of these. Again, it's um, 
It's this gas, uh, most large elliptical galaxies are surrounded by a halo of hot, um, which temperature is anywhere between 1 and 10 million degrees Kelvin. Oh, that's hot. Um, which is X-ray emitting gas, and that's yeah, how we've discovered it by using X-ray. Yeah. yeah, yeah. These galaxies are generally found in groups or clusters of galaxies where the whole region is pervaded by X-ray emitting gas. For this, for this reason, it is not clear whether the X-ray halo around an individual galaxy is associated with the galaxy itself mm. or the group or cluster to which it belongs. And it can be difficult to distinguish whether individual X-ray halos, where X-ray halos end and the interstellar or the intra-cluster medium begins. Now, there are several ways that this gas can be, because, um, of course, this also, this hot gas, what happens is, is, hot gas is no good for store star formation so what they can do is actually they can quench the star formation within galaxies themselves mm. so basically the galaxy will snuff out any um, uh, new stars being made um there are several ways that they th- well three or four ways that they think that um that this can happen with the gas being made hot uh, you've got galactic winds uh, the hot gas is blown out of the galaxies by evolving stars and supernova mm-hmm. Uh, ram pressure stripping the hot gas of the galaxy moving within its group or cluster may be removed through interaction with the intercluster medium mm. uh, so basically as it moves through because uh, all these uh, galaxies are moving within the clusters and as they move through this hot gas it strips away the gas within the galaxies themselves right. and it forms something that we know as a jellyfish galaxy if you see it in ah, the um, yes, we talked about that didn't we yeah yes, in yes. the x-ray uh, yes. they look like jellyfish with they tendrils do. of gas falling off yes. them yes um in galaxy strangulation uh, the hot gas is evaporated from the galaxy as it falls into the group or of the actual cluster. And there is also some suggestion that maybe uh, a- active um, uh, galactic nuclei uh, uh, have big feeding um, black holes in the centres right. could be emitting so much energy that it's heating the gas and again st- uh, staunching um, uh, the star formation. Mm. And also because of the the dark, uh, the dark, dark, because it sits there in the actual cluster itself. It's an indication that there's not enough mass in the the, the cluster. Uh, why is it still sat there? It should dissipate, but it doesn't. So it's, mm. again, it's another indication of a thing called dark matter. Ah, oh, that's um, X-ray gas. Wow. X-ray gas. So there we are. So yes, mm. I'm afraid there wasn't anything else that I could find that was remotely interesting. Beginning with X, uh, it's, <laughs> all, X, it's all X-ray dark. stuff, basically. Y is for Elam, Y-L-E-M. Uh, I assume that's how it's pronounced anyway. And this is a hypothetical state of matter which existed at the beginning of the universe, which later condensed, if you like, into subatomic particles. So before there were particles in the universe, there was this state of matter uh, called Elam, but it is hypothetical and uh it it was thought of by george gamow famous physicist and uh his student ralph alpha i don't know whether you know the story that uh he was uh george gamow was invited to participate in a scientific paper and along with ralph alpha by uh hans beta and they were, they were invited to become co-authors on this paper, even though they didn't contribute it at all, solely because the list of authors would therefore be Alpha, Beta, Gamma. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did hear that. Yeah, yeah. which is a lovely story. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, so yes, because Alpha found this word, Elam, which, you know, looking at it, Y-L-E-M is a bit of a strange word. It's actually Middle English, would you believe? Mm-hmm. And it's an English, an old Middle English term that is defined as the first substance from which the elements were supposed to have been formed in the oh, universe. Okay, then. Um, and, you know, uh, and it was taken by, by Gamma and, and Alpha to mean the state of matter that existed before the first particles in the universe formed. Uh, and they called it Elam. Now, um, So this is, you know, it's still used. You don't hear it much these days, but there is obviously, you know, a case for saying, well, before the first particles were formed, there must have been a state of matter. 
as we understand it, or a state, I wouldn't say it was matter, because if there was no, no particles, there was no matter, a state of something. And uh, it was called Elam, but uh, you don't hear it used that much, because we now know that, you know, the first particles really existed in, uh, you know, a very, very, very uh, tiny space of time after the Big Bang. We had the quark lepton soup, essentially, which were the first particles. And um, there's no need really to say that there was a stage before that where there was this, you know, undefined thing that the universe consisted of before the particles. And it's not really that helpful. Uh, so there we are. So that's mm. Elam for you, Y-L-E-M, Middle English term, uh, meaning the primordial state of matter from which the first elements formed. But oh, we now know that the elements yeah. didn't form from that. They formed yeah. you know, much, much later, much later. And in fact, of course, the first atoms didn't form until um, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which is when we had the era of uh, um, uh, reionization, when yeah. the universe had cooled down sufficiently for electrons to be pulled into orbiting atoms. And then we had the first, well, of orbiting protons and neutrons, and then we had the first atoms. And this allowed photons in the universe to travel across the universe for the first time, because before that, the universe had been far too hot and energetic. Any photon that was emitted was almost immediately reabsorbed by another particle. So there was no light. And uh, this was the universe's first light, if you like, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And that wave of radiation that was unleashed at that point, we now observe all over the sky as the cosmic microwave background radiation, which was emitted yes. this period of uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And we talked about that. And we talked about Penzias and Wilson and the, 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 the pigeon dung in, in the antenna yeah. and all of that. That lovely story. And we, we now know that the, the cosmic microwave background, it, it became, as we've said before, when we talked um, uh, about this, um, about Fred Hoyle and others, that um, the cosmic microwave background became the final nail in the coffin of steady state theory. The flat, uh, the, not the flat earth, it's the steady state is much the same sort of thinking. <laughs> Um, didn't have an answer for it. They couldn't explain where this ray wave of radiation that we see all over the sky comes from. And when it was worked out that the temperature of it agrees almost exactly with what was predicted the cosmic microwave temperature to be, then that was game over for the, the steady status because they had nothing like it in their theories that, that either predicted your existence or predicted its temperature. And, of course, as we know, Fred Hoyle went to his grave still maintaining yeah. that, uh, that uh, the, the steady state theory is the correct one. Um, but uh, there we are. So that's Elam, Daz. So, yeah, uh, so there we fantastic. are. Was this Gamma, was he the chap, was he one of Hoyle's nemesis? Because they all used to cross swords. Yes, so, yes very much yeah. so. Very much it, so. Gamma was an expansionist and Hoyle was a steady yes, state. He, he actually used to taunt, um, taunt him. Um, mm. I used to taunt yeah. Hoyle uh, in very subtle ways from what I've read. Um, yeah. And um, because, you know, there were gentlemen scientists and it, it, it wouldn't have been the done thing to have a, you know, yeah. you bastard type of slanging match. Yeah. Um, so take it out of the car park. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you want to step outside, mate? Yeah I'll, yeah, I'll show you what your state steady state theory is worth. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to ram it down your gizzard, mate. Uh, yeah. So, um, yes, I mean, they, they just had this ongoing feud. Yeah, I, I can remember because also Hoyle was. I mean, he, even to the his, almost his dying day, he was coming up with theories as to uh, what was happening at the very beginning of uh, uh, the universe. Um, and there was something I think something about graphite needles and things like that, which yeah, could produce the right. same. It, it, he was. He was. Oh, bless him. I mean, he was a, a very, very, very um, intelligent the, chap. And he, he was. Uh, the, the thing is, though, to make steady state theory work after the discovery of the, the cosmic microwave background, yeah. the steady statists had to, you know, completely overhaul their theories and keep modifying it and keep modifying it. And you can take that so far with the scientific yeah. theory until you have to, to turn around and say, this doesn't work. We were wrong. 
Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, because if you look at a lot of scientific theories that have been, and this is the nature of science, after all, that theories do get modified in the late of new observations, and that's how we progress and that's how we learn things. Mm. It's the scientific method in action. And sure, but when you have to end up with your, your original theory looking unrecognizable to accommodate um, observations, then, then it's just not going to yeah. work. Yeah, bless him, bless, bless him. him. Yeah. Right, uh, I think uh, what we will do is move on to Z because I didn't have any Ys, so you did a lot better than I did. Right. <laughs> and my Z... Mm. is the Zooniverse. Now, I wanted to mention this one um, oh, because it's a, something that's that... A, that's a good call. That is a very yeah, good call. Yeah, because it's something that um, everybody can get involved in, even the listener. And um, basically, the zoo, the Zooniverse uh, is citizen science. And with all the new technologies and all the new telescopes, the Gaia's, um, with the James Webb's, we, mm. hopefully, fingers crossed, everything goes right, and all this stuff, we're going to have mega, the Vera Rubin especially, and the, um, the, uh, the kilometre array. Um, it's, mm. We're going to have so much data that it's going to be so much that not one person or a hundred people or a thousand people will be able to deal with it. So it's called citizen science. And what they will be doing is producing all the data, making it available. And it will be up to you, me and Joe Bloggs, even your dog, if it wants to have a go to go through this data and help scientists actually discover new things. Um, it all started back in um, uh, back in the day with uh, Galaxy Zoo. I don't know if many people remember that, and that's something that's still ongoing. And what it was is that with all the galaxies, all the, the big, um, with Hubble and things like that, is that there are so many galaxies that to actually try and categorize every single one of them was impossible to do. So what they did is they, they put all the data in one place, and then you go along, you sign yourself up, They'll give you a little bit of training, what you've got to do. And then all you do is you sit there and you go through and you categorize um, the galaxies, whether they're spirals, whether they're elliptical or whatever, what their color, um, whether they're star forming and things like that. Mm. And your information goes back and it goes into the catalog and any main uh, big discoveries and all that, you will actually be accredited in with all the everyone everyone else so you'll probably find it's probably a thousand pages thick and 99 999 pages of them it's just a list of everybody who's been involved in it i've, I'm um, actually, um, I've actually done a few thousand classifications in galaxy zoo i do enjoy it yeah and you can and remember you yeah and remember you're probably the first person to ever look at that galaxy yeah it's amazing on its individually it's so you'll be the yeah. very first person to look at that yeah because a lot of um, these it, come out of uh, robotic surveys where there are no humans exactly involved, yeah and you could yeah. be the first person ever in history to see that galaxy so you yeah. get involved with with galaxy zoo yeah i mean you you if you actually take part you're actually called a zooite Oh, so, am I? Uh, I didn't know that's yeah, what I called. You're a zoo watch. Yeah, that's there. Right. Yeah, that's you're nice all a zoo watch. Yeah. That's another, another um, feather to and my uh, the principal investigator uh, for the project was, of course, uh, we all know him as from Sky at Night, is Chris Lintop. Yeah, good. Old. Um, and he's actually written a book, a book about the uh, the crowd and the cosmos adventures in New Zoo Universe. But it's something. But it's not just to do with um, uh, space. No, there's, no, indeed. There's one where you can actually you can watch videos of chimpanzees and you can identify you identify them by their markings. There, there are and lots like and that. lots of projects involving yeah. wildlife and nature that you can. Yeah. I took part in one for and medical and medical. Yeah, yeah, medical. Everything is on the Zooniverse. Yeah, and, you know, and 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 the Zooniverse needs your help. You don't have to have any scientific training if you've got an inquisitive mind and you like finding out things. The Zooniverse is for you, and you you're helping in yeah. a, in a in a very good way indeed. Exactly. Yeah. One of them's even just reading um, uh, war diaries, yes, um, which you report back and those, pull yeah. out all the um, yeah. pull out all the information. So that to, for historians and that, there's art on so there. There's, there's everything yeah. on there. Yeah, you know, whatever you so interest, go to uh, go to the zoo universe. The zoo universe, and you you you'll learn something and you'll enjoy doing it. Fantastic. So that's my Z, that's my Z zoo. Universe. Right, right. Uh, d- yeah, do do get involved if you can, because the more people that get involved. Uh, the more productive the whole thing will will be, 
and you know you can do it when you've got when you've got the time if you've got 10 minutes of coffee sit down and classify a few galaxies or to transcribe some victorian botanical notes work out what they're trying to say and um and you know that there's so i i did a fascinating project a couple of years ago where i was classifying whale song so that they uh, so honestly really interesting so that they can mm. work out how whales are communicating and what they're saying when they are communicating so all this sort of thing so so there you are do get involved in this universe it's a, it's a worthy cause it's all for free and you are contributing directly to the sum of human knowledge which is always a great thing yep that's yep. fantastic okay wow. right then i think time has got the better of us hasn't it Daz? Yes, we're one yeah, hour and 11 yeah. minutes. So for the final time from the Amazing Astronomical Alphabet, we will bid you goodbye. But as I said at the beginning of the programme, we will be back very soon with, uh, with some more programmes, which we hope will uh, uh, teach you a few things and entertain you at the same time, which is what it's all about. So from Daz and myself, uh, look after yourselves. Thank you so much for being our listeners on the Amazing Astronomical Alphabet, if indeed you have. And if you haven't, you can go and hear our previous programs on mixcloud.com where uh, Astro Radio stows all its uh, all its repeats. So from us, from Daz and myself, thank you very much. Yeah. And everybody will... take care. Take care, stay everybody. Stay safe. Yeah. Stay safe. Stay safe out there. And we will speak to you very soon. So for the final time from the amazing Astronomical Alphabet, goodbye. Bye for now.